Hello and welcome to the Nattercast for True Detective Season 1, part one of our two-part coverage of uh, True Detective. I am Jason Shankle of Shankle Studios and I am here with my task force. Say hello, task force. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. <laughs> and we're here tonight to natter at you about uh, True Detective, which was just uh, quite a wonderful little treasure that we had. Uh, this spring. Um, before uh, we get into our recaps and our coverage, let me just tell you who we are. We are the Nattercast. You can reach us at www.nattercast.com and you can send us an email at uh, nattercast at gmail.com and where all the excitement really is for us is on Facebook. If you go to Facebook to uh, www.facebook.com slash groups slash Nattercast, you'll find our Nattercast group um, where people are there talking about not just True Detective, but The Americans and uh, Walking Dead and The Good Wife and uh, we've got Game of Thrones coming up. It's going to be awesome. And also, if you just go to www.facebook.com slash Nattercast, you'll find our Nattercast page, and we'd appreciate it if you would like us there. Uh, that gets us a little more visibility, and that's where, where a lot of our announcements come out and things like that. And also, if you're listening to us on iTunes, please, please, please hit us with a five-star review. we got a couple of good, nice five-star reviews this uh, this last couple uh, week or two, and uh, that's the best thing you can do for us to get us a little more visible on iTunes and, and bring more listeners in. So, um, but this, uh, tonight, we are doing True Detective, and uh, let me just tell you, I mean, holy shit, internet. <laughs> We were hoping, we were trying to get a little more audience for our podcast. We're a humble little cast, you know, and we've got, we have people listening to us, and we said, let's, let's go out and, and see if we can drum up some business on True Detective, get some people uh, interested in Nattercast, and boy, did you guys arrive. We, we set up this group, there's a, a whole separate group, if you're a, a regular Nattercast listener, called uh, I Can't Stop <laughs> Watching True Detective, that we set up, because we found, see, Yeah, I, I just, one night, we were... We had just finished watching it, and we're like, we got to just, and he goes, can we keep, keep continue? And I go, of course. And I just stood up there and said, we can't stop watching this. We, and we couldn't. So that's, we made the group. We made that group, and we got like 600 people in before the end of the show. We're at 650 people in there now. We got like 50 people who have joined since the show is over. It was, mm-hmm. And it was almost like we weren't even there. People just showed up and started having and a just, party around us. Big yeah. party. And talking mm-hmm. with each other, forming ideas and, and clubs. And they, they're, re- they're doing all kinds of stuff. They, and they, submitting everything they can possibly find. got to have been at least six weddings by now. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Conspiracy theories. It was there's great. A, there's new little offshoot groups. We met some great Natter people who came in to join the, the Natter group. And the Natter group's gotten a lot more lively. You know, because we got so much new blood out of this. So this show's really done well for us. So we have to say thank you to Nick Pizzolato, uh, affectionately known as the Pizza Latte, for <laughs> helping us helping us really boost our cast and boost our audience. Yeah, cheers, And making Nick. a good show. And making a great show. Right. Well, it was such a cerebral show. I think people liked that, liked the psychological uh, makeups of these two very different characters getting thrown together. Absolutely. And, yeah, uh, yeah it spawned a ton of conversation. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and just and, and and once it got into like Yellow King and Robert Chambers and just <laughs> the literary the literary references, references yeah. and, and the acting, and so uh, we actually want I think I want to start off with a little listener feedback because we had so many so much activity and and the listener feedback. Normally, I just go and I gather listener feedback and we get enough for the show and that's kind of it. There was no hope of gathering all the listener feedback for this. We just uh, I actually went into threads and I made targeted questions to try and focus people. So we have our first question. So basically we have the listener feedback into two uh, sections here. Yes. Um, and the first um, section is, when were you first hooked? Um, and I'll just say for myself, um, it was the credits. Yeah. And then I was pretty hooked. And I'm like, oh, these are good credits. And then as soon as he started, like he's doing his little cigarette beer thing, he's sitting there and he's starting to, to speak as if he might have an IQ. I was like, that's it. I'm done. I've got to see this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Please don't fail me. This is just, this is, I'm so hooked. And I said it out loud. I was on the couch and went, oh, I am just so in. Yeah. I think I was in about seven seconds in. Yeah. It was really quick for both of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were both looking at each other. We're in. We're in. <laughs> yeah. And so we have from one of our listeners, Kim Sheriff. 
I was hooked from the moment Rust started his initial theory of the universe while driving in the car with Marty. That's when I realized that this is going to be a very different type of procedural, one with a lot more depth. And a nice long one from Stephanie Brown Anderson. It was Matthew McConaughey that hooked me. Rust Cole fascinated me from the minute he opened his mouth. I remember watching the premiere and being completely hooked by the end of the first scene of Rust with Gilbo and Papina. Uh, the bit with the cigarettes, his gestures, facial expressions, and tone captivated me. That's the stuff I'm a sucker for. The second thing that grabbed me was the shot at the crime scene of Marty walking in front of that row of cops sent out to help with the search. Then they panned over to Russ standing alone next to Dora. It was clear at that point that this show was carefully done and ripe with meaning and symbolism. I knew it was going to be a smart show that had respect for its audience. And the name Dora Lang, it immediately made me think of Dorothea Lang. I liked that. It gave the impression that Nick P. Pizzolatte was going to tell us a story of a depressed people and a place, and we would be introduced to this place, these people, their lives, through the story of Dora, just as we saw the lives of the people fleeing the Dust Bowl through the lens of Dorothea Lang. Hmm. Interesting point. Yeah, very good. Now, did, we, got a, we got a letter last week that Dora Lang was a real person, that this was based on a real event. Um, uh, so I looked into this. It. Uh, it, it, um, <laughs> I don't know about the name Dora Lang. Somebody said that, that, that this was the name, but there were a couple of killings where the bodies were found in uh, sugar cane fields. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. One in 79 and one at some other point. Uh, neither of them were set up like this or had any of this uh, you know, element to it. It was just they were found in sugar cane fields. Ah, okay. the and somebody said that they, seemed, they remembered that one of them was named Dora Lang, but, you know. But was it Erath? Erath is the name of the town, right? Yes, it was. This is in Erath, Louisiana. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. All righty. So let's. You know what? How are we going to do this? So we want to be a little more loosey goosey on these things, you know. So I've got a little bit of uh, audio from the show uh, to to kind of introduce each of the chapters, and then we're going to kind of go around and just just talk about the first four chapters tonight on this on this episode. And you can get the second four, the back half. Uh, on our next one, so uh, let's hear a little bit of uh, True Detective. Can you uh, tell us anything about that, Mr. Cole? Yeah, it looks a lot like the one from 95. Well, you knew that already. Yeah, there is specifics consistent to the 95 case. Details that weren't public knowledge. You were off the grid for eight years, right? Show back up here 2010. My question is... How could it be him? If we already caught him in 95. How indeed, detectives? I figured you'd be the one to know. Didn't start asking the right fucking questions. Okay. <laughs> Last line. Classic. 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 And that's and that was pretty much hooked. That's I was definitely hooked. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that nailed it. That, that had me going wee. Yeah. Wee. Um. And uh, yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the first episode, shall we? And we'll do get back to a little more of our feedback uh, in a bit. So, you know, we start off the show and we, we see this, you know, sort of lumbering uh, figure dragging a body through the sugar cane fields, right? And the light's on fire. And then we get to uh, Rust and uh, the introduction of Marty and Rust. And they're being uh, interviewed five days apart, first Rust and then Marty. Mm -hmm. um, and we get the uh, idea that these are two detectives who had... Uh, I thought it was Marty and then Rust. No, mm -hmm. see, that's what everybody thinks. You see Marty first. Oh. But Marty's actually being interviewed after Rust. Oh. Rust gets interviewed first because that's why Rust comes up later on and chases him down right after his interview because he's right. already been interviewed at that time. <clears throat> and uh, and you, so right away, I like both of these guys. You know, as, it's it, as, as characters anyway. Okay. It's like you know, here's Marty's kind of like this good old boy who's sort of uh, you know, and he introduces himself as very much a family man and a regular 
guy with a big ass dick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. And 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 Rust is this sort of like burned out, crazed hippie surfer mm-hmm. looking guy, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, skeletal, uh, looking. skeletal looking yeah, guy. Rust you know, looks this... like he gave up just on life a long time ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about you see you know, I I pegged him to die in the first episode. I thought he was gonna be dead. Once I knew yeah. that, that they were doing something dangerous I thought he was gonna die because he looked. He had a fa- he has a fatalistic attitude toward everything in the first place, and he just looked like hell. Yeah, you know, he chain smokes, he drinks too much, and that's all he does, and, and just be down on life in general. Yeah, yeah, and, and that that kind of hooked me in too. Is like here, here's a guy who's uh, you know, um, they're totally nihilistic, right? And then we what I found fascinating is that we cut back to the to ninety five, and we see them you know looking at Dora Lang's case. Right, and you see Rust, especially Rust, looks very different. Mm-hmm. Right, he's the tax man. He's got this big ledger, you mm-hmm. know. And Marty's like, he's he came out of Texas. People thought he might have been a Fed. You know, he was aloof and st- he's kind of strange, you know, and everything like that. Has a mysterious past. Has a mysterious past, and then and you're thinking, you're looking at Marty, and you're saying, okay, this Marty looks like a guy who logically came from the from the '95 Marty. You know, mm-hmm. just he looked like an older version of that guy. Yeah. Right. Uh, but Russ looks like he's gone through a lot. Yeah. Okay. yeah. He looks like <laughs> yeah. heavy road, <laughs> as we will find out. You know. <laughs> um, and yeah, and you, and you get the idea that he's aloof. And then I found it was really interesting that uh, he he's you know they really set up the idea that that Rust is the intellectual and Marty's the you know, uh, emotional. more emotional or, or, you know, more of a straightforward cop. Yeah. And uh, he says, you know, uh, we had encountered a metapsychotic, you know, mm-hmm. and I've, you know, I do a little research on this stuff and I know something about it. I've never heard metapsychotic and I did a lot of looking and I, I found it in a couple of places, but it's not really a term that people use, mm-hmm. you know, but what I found out was metapsychotic with an M means, um, or metapsychosis is a reincarnation into the body of an animal. Oh, right. Oh, so that's that, that, okay. and as soon as I looked, I was like, while we were watching, I just Googled that. I'm like, oh, we're metapsychotic. It's like, oh, metempsychotic means reincarnation to an animal. So that's why I knew they were doing, doing layers here because uh-huh. you had the antlers, the antlers and everything like that. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so Dora Lang is found in a field with Sherry Kane. She has a spiral on her back. We're getting all the basic clues here, you know, and there's these little bird cages made out of sticks. And Cole is right away, he's on Serial Killer. And the thing that made me like Marty right away is that he said, you know, instead of doing the usual sort of uh, of cliched thing of either completely shutting the idea down, you know, and calling him insane, or immediately embracing that they have a serial killer, he's like, uh, you know, I didn't think of those books of yours about jumping to conclusions. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, and that's totally true. It's like, you know, jumping to conclusions. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So then we're in the car on the way back. That was another great scene that I, I thought where you know it's like uh, Marty explains to the detectives. You know, this is Mar- I should explain Marty's and and Cole are being questioned in 2012 mm-hmm. about a crime that took place in 1995, and uh, they'd been together for three months and had no conversations with each other or whatever. And you know, Marty just picks this day to invite uh, Cole to uh, dinner. <laughs> yes. Oh, he said he couldn't put the wife off any longer. Because right, the wife kept right. saying, I've got to meet this gotta guy. This guy's this got guy. your back. This is the guy who keeps you alive out there. Exactly, yeah. right, exactly. Right. Um, and so. Uh, and it doesn't go well. It, just, it doesn't go <laughs> no. well. But before they get to the dinners, uh, then they're you know in the car, and his, Marty's kind of sh- shaken by what they found. And, uh, you know, uh, he asked Cole, you know, well, what do you think about about life right and we started to get this life philosophy basically that human intelligence is a tragic mistake yeah. <laughs> you know and we evolved too far we've evolved too far and we're just these self-obsessed pieces of meat you know and, and, and the human like, race would be better off if it died off and is that when yeah. marty made that great that great comment okay how about the car be a place of quiet <laughs> quiet reflection yeah. it's, well it's like three months i get nothing out of you yeah. and today now i get this, now I get this. I, and he's like well you asked he's like i am now i'm begging you to yeah. shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it is a cliche to have the mismatched partners. Yes. But usually one of them isn't like this. Well, usually one's a slob and one's neat or whatever. You yeah. know, and I think this is something that was part of the strength of the show and maybe part of the weakness of it, especially toward the end, is it's very cliched, right? Mm-hmm. Very intentionally, it's a serial killer cop procedural, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, Pizzolatto was talking to. Uh, um, Alan Sepinwall and said that he's not interested in serial killers, 
right? And so as I think he, the serial killer story doesn't interest him. He wants to do a story about cops and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and their relationship. Mm-hmm. And the serial killer story is just the framing device for that character exploration. And I think that ultimately that was helpful because it gave us these these great character interactions where he wasn't obsessing us on the procedure. Right. But in the end, you are telling a serial killer story, so you and need so to pay it, it off to better. It. Yeah. Right. And it's like if Frank Darabont says, "I don't like zombies." <laughs> 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 right. Well, you're doing you or did we're doing a zombie show, Frank? Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, Right, let's see, so where... So oh, there's a nice moment where Marty's like, uh, don't talk like... When, when yeah. Russ, he, Russ is talking about religion and how he doesn't believe in anything, and Marty, don't talk about this well, around other people. Yeah, it's like, people around here don't think like... Funny. He's like, it's like, I can taste the metal here and I can smell the psychosphere. <laughs> and then later on, they're they're going to uh, interview somebody and they come out and he's like, this is like a faded memory of a town that's being eaten up by the jungle. And he's like, right. stop <laughs> talking like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the other thing that hooked me was the humor. Yes, yeah, that yeah. was funny. Uh, just like uh, Woody Harrelson's a great comedian. He does. A, he's right. a, he's the great good old boy. He, he does, does a great good old yeah. boy. He, he does. does a great ex, you know, serial killer. He does a great, yeah. silly, goofy guy working the bar. He, great hard ass. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's talk real quick about Matthew McConaughey, though. I mean, did any of you guys have any idea that he was this good of an actor? Uh, Aside from, I mean, no, I mean, in general, with Magic Mike and with uh, Buyers Club, his last couple of years, he went through a period of just starring in dumb romantic comedies, but now he's had this sort of reawakening where he's actually making good movies. I had weird. no idea who was that mm-hmm. good. No, I mean, I was, I, that's what hooked me on the show was just him being so goddamn good. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's a great character. Yeah, it didn't surprise me because I saw elements of it before because yeah. I've seen a lot of his work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really loved him in Magic Mike. Um, so yeah. it didn't surprise me. And, and also, from what I know of people who have the big machines and are really savvy about being, particularly the male actors, who are, are, can play a lead or a sidekick, um, which she can, there's a period when you're young, you go for the money grab. Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't take the meaty roles. You take the, whatever shitty little romance that will pay you millions of dollars, mm-hmm. little action films, whatever. And to us, we think, oh, well, he's making bad choices. Th- he's not getting a lot of choices. He's getting maybe two right. choices, and he's picking the one with the bigger money. Because once that period of your life is over, it's done, mm-hmm. and then you can pick these meteor roles. Mm-hmm. Right. That's if you really want to own your stuff and build your own production company. He's playing, he is thinking, he even said it in his... He, so, some uh, a little bit he alluded to it in his Oscar speech. Right, he's playing the long game, and there's mm-hmm. several actors who have done that, and they're the ones that make the bank. And then everybody's always surprised when they see them in meeting roles. It's mm. they were they were like this all along. Mm-hmm. Right, right, it's just that you're. It, it isn't like he's handed twenty scripts. Well, probably now he is, but you're not handed twenty scripts and like, well, here's one where you're going to be paid scale. Oh, sure. And cry a bunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's the one for five get, million. You're lucky to get a toilet paper commercial. Exactly, right, so exactly. You, you take it. So he's he he really played it well, and I've seen him do little flavors of things and, and shift and change. So it didn't surprise me, but I was still in awe. Yeah. Mm. I was, st- but I was more in awe that somebody wrote a character that was that nuanced and dark. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but still sympathetic. I loved yeah. the shot where he's saying that uh, after getting invited to dinner, you know, that he was he just knew he was going to take a drink. He's talking about his daughter. Uh-huh. And you get the idea right, his daughter's yeah. dead, right. and he's just walking along the the sugar cane, and his eye is right on the horizon, and it just guides to the horizon. He's just smoking and walking. It's like I'm going to take a drink. Uh-huh. You know, it's like this this fate that he's on. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, well, so the parts of the case unfold here. They uh, investigate the disappearance of Marie Fontenot, uh, who is a girl who was reported missing, and then the report was withdrawn because they believe she was with her father, taken with her father. Her mother pretty much abandoned her. Uh, and they talk to the sheriff about her disappearance, and another girl who apparently saw the, the green-eyed spaghetti monster, which becomes mm-hmm. one of our big clues. Who is mm-hmm. Green-eared. Oh. Green-eared. 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 Yes. Yes. Spaghetti yes. monster. Yes. Um, who was like a, a, you know, chased her through the woods or whatever. And uh, so I'm like, okay, this is, so there's going to be some spaghetti monster. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been kind of cool. Let's put out an APB on spaghetti if monster. If it was Cthulhu. 
See, that's where everyone was like, oh, it's going to be Cthulhu. Yeah, right. This, yeah, like, not quite in this first episode, but by the third, people were like, oh, it's going to be a, a demon. And it's like, oh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. But, I'm glad they did not take the supernatural. Oh, thank part. God. Yes. 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 I would have so, I would have just stopped watching. Me too. I would have tuned out. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and so then the other, th- the other little bit here is uh, Cole... Uh, takes off on his own and he interviews a couple of sex workers at a truck stop who uh, might have known the uh, known Dora Lang and then he uh, solicits one of them for pills for something barbital because mm. I don't sleep I just dream <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> dark do you speak all in Johnny Cash lines I mean what is yeah that? really <laughs> apparently so I get the idea that he's a, he's a drug addict and an insomniac you know um, and he doesn't he doesn't mind a uh, uh, Buying drugs from his from his suspect. Okay, so there's the last couple of elements here. So we have Marie Fontenot, uh, and they uh, they ultimately uh, in, um, talk to her uncle, who's a former ba- baseball player, who's had a stroke, and they find a devil catcher in her shed. That's the end of that. Mm-hmm. That's the end of the episode. But before that, they find some mutilated uh, cats at a black church, and Cole shows the reverend. Uh, uh, sketches of the catchers, and we get the idea that this is a Santeria thing that his grandmother kind of used to do, make have kids make these little devil catchers, that, mm. you know, kind of deal. And then we get to meet uh, Reverend Tuttle, who mm-hmm. is immediately everyone's prime suspect. It's like, because here's, I forget the guy, the actor's name. He's, oh, he's so that. smarmy. He's so smarmy. Yeah. And uh, he's, uh, he's clear, he's a, he's a big named actor, right? And he's this minor yeah, I character. the actor's name, but. Yeah. And the way that he comes in, like, well, I think there's a war going on. Obviously, yeah, this is an anti-Christian crime. Like, right. And uh, so i got to say, I got uh, um, immediately on the anti-Christian angle, I started thinking about uh, the uh, West Memphis Three, those kids who were right. like, you know... Uh, Bulldozed. Bulldozed into because, uh, oh, Satanists killed these people. It's like, you know, are these little kids. It's like, they're not, A, they're not Satanists, B, Satanists didn't do it. Right. You know, um, and I, I started to see a lot of comparisons between sort of this uh, satanic panic from mm. the 80s mm-hmm. and, and this, this period here. Um, and oh, the big. Also, s- we did uh, meet yeah. uh, Dora's ex boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie Lang. Charlie, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Kind of ex husband. Ex husband. Charlie Lang. Yeah. Yeah, and he says that Dora was, you know, he called her and she was like completely whacked out. Met a king, is going to be a nun. And so evidently right. she was a party girl and a little bit insane. You I know. liked Charlie. I liked, I liked the, the, I mean, the was, actor yeah, who played him did a really good job. Good uh, the actor did a great job with Charlie, I thought. Um, but the big scene for the episode, though, before I um, move on, is uh, I believe it's in this one, he comes to dinner drunk. Right, yes. right. It's like right. After, after like three months, and it's like you never come out drinking with the guys. You never have a drink with me. You have to get a load on before you come to my house. You know, uh-huh. and this is the this is his daughter's birthday. Right, right. And uh, Marty tries to say, "Okay, just come in five minutes, have a cup of coffee, and I'll I'll call somebody and we'll get you out of here." Right, right. But then he doesn't take the out. You know, after he starts talking to Maggie. About yeah, his, uh... and he tells Maggie about his daughter, right, dying when. When uh, Marty's out of the room, because Marty didn't right. know about it till later, right? Right, right, yeah. exactly. And that's when that's Marty didn't know about it till later. And, and uh, um, th- this is when you see this going to be a real edge to Cole. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, there's going to be some heavy drama in this thing where these guys are going to like lose their shit and everything. It's Bruce Altman who played uh, the Reverend. Played mm-hmm. Tuttle. Played Very Tuttle. Good. Yeah. So before we move on, let's uh, we have a little more uh, feedback on uh, what got you hooked. And there's another one from Sally Piccolo. The devil catcher, devil catchers hooked me. I kept looking for them in every scene and got caught. Mm-hmm. And then Irene Bailey Bird. When I saw Dora Lang's body, I thought this is going to be a damn good series. <laughs> sort of like the Green River thing with the women placed alongside the expressway so the drivers could see them. Then Douglas Joseph La Barbera. When I heard the song Far From Any Road, I knew too. That song resonates through the whole hour show. No? Actually, I can't get it out of my head. The Poison Creosote. Absolutely. Yeah, mm. Poison Creosote. The, uh, that captures the show. Totally, the road, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and then Ronnie Carlton. Good question. The fight between Maggie and Marty got my attention, but I guess it was episode three, the whole monster monologue, monologue at the end. Yeah. And Solange says, I knew I was hooked 10 minutes in when Rust gives his mistake of evolution speech, because I agree, we are a virus. Also, when he capped it off with refusing to reproduce and opting out of a raw deal, I nearly stood up and applauded. I call my BFF immediately and basically bullied him into watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure he was grateful for. <laughs> and last, Jackie Burgett. The preview intrigued me. And you know, Jack, that's a good thing you brought that up because I remember seeing the preview like a month before, just in a flash. Uh-huh. And I went, oh, 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 that looks really good. <laughs> yeah. But I knew I was going to like this and Rust at the beginning of the interview went to light a cigarette, was told not to smoke, reaches for lighter, flips open, and says, don't be assholes. Yeah. <laughs> is that his first words on the, on the show? Don't be assholes. Y'all want to it's hear very this very close, yeah, yeah. to his first words. All right, well, before we jump into the episode two, we've got a little more, a little more audio from the show to listen to. And uh, ooh, I, I might have a little lead-in, so I'm going to babble for a second while it plays. <laughs> Here we go. Let's cut to the point. As the crow flies, you all are wanting to ask about that big throwdown in the woods. Yeah? Eventually, sure. Right now, we're just trying to track the case. How Cole worked it, especially. Which indicates you think I'm too thick to realize that you all are trying to jam somebody up. You're on to something new. So Cole didn't want to give it to the task force. Did you? No. <laughs> I did not. No. <laughs> All right, I'm going to no. hand it over to, I believe, Mr. Gary, are you yeah, number two? I, yeah. I get episode two, and I, I love this episode. Not a lot happened in the story. We get the boys uh, digging for you know more clues and more people to talk to. But it, I think this episode was really more about character development. We learn a lot more about their backgrounds, what kind of went into making them the guys that they are. Um, they start. They go. They go to see Dora Lang's mom, who was played by Tess Harper. Yeah. Mm. What a lucky actress. Bit parts, but in two of the best shows ever. Breaking Bad. She played Jesse Pinkman's mom. That's right. And oh, now she that's plays right. Dora mm-hmm. Lang's mom. Right. So kudos to her. Great job. And. Um, we get a little family history on, uh, you know, they're driving along and, and uh, Marty was talking about his mom. He says, my mom was kind of the Donna Reed type, right? you know, and, and for those who are younger, in fact, this is even <laughs> before my time, Donna Reed was a TV mom in the 50s. Per- everything was perfect. House was perfect. She was perfect. Kids were perfect. It was, it was mm. the image that they were trying to. You know, pass off as you didn't break a sweat man. vacuuming, right? Right, right. And you yeah. always looked fabulous, vacuum in heels. And I thought that was yeah. because women were magical back then. Yeah, yeah. Do I remember seeing that on a show? Well, remember <laughs> Bewitched? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the 60s, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Predates yeah. Bewitched. But right, anyway, yeah. um, so uh, Marty's mom is, is the perfect mom, which may give us a little insight into why Marty sees the world the way that he does. Right. He sees the world as kind of there to serve his needs. Right. He alludes to that when he's in this fight with um, with Maggie in the kitchen. Um, you know, they're they're going at each other, and he says, "You know, you're supposed to be here to support me and to help me." And you know, I, I love shouldn't that have to... fight. The fight was great. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was well acted, but again, kind of a cliche. The Almost every cop movie has a scene where the cop's wife says, you know, you aren't here for the family enough. And it's the, well, you don't understand the job. Well, but that's, those are Marty's excuses, though. I yeah. Mean, he, he we see what he's really doing with his time. Yeah, yeah. in this case, he's lying. But well, and still. not just that, but did you notice that he's accusing her stuff of stuff that she wasn't doing? Yeah. She was accusing her of stuff that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Right. He kept yeah. saying, you're giving me this whiny, poor me bullshit when I have to look at dead antler ladies all day. Yeah. You know, and so he's the one who's whiny. That was good. And she... <laughs> We never. I mean, maybe she did on the car on the way home, but we never hear Maggie complain on her own behalf, like "Poor me, please right, pity me." Right. It's yeah, always, she's, she's not a wimp or whiny or no, no, bitchy not at, at all. all. No, he but Marty is turning it yeah. on her. He's turning yeah. his nose. He's projecting. He's projecting. It. Yeah. And there was something that happened that uh, I know it's happened in a couple places. He used uh, a scene from Heat. He comes up. He says mm-hmm. to her. 
uh, what do you want me to do? Tell you about the kid, you know, the woman I found dead, and, and then maybe I'll, through my talking to you, I'll have this catharsis. That line is straight out of heat. Al Pacino threw through that same oh, bullshit really? at his wife. Oh wow! Uh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he he does a couple more lines from Heat throughout the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or maybe so, um, maybe Pizzolatto's just lazy. Sorry. So we learned that uh, Marty isn't quite the wholesome family man that that he. Yeah. Put <laughs> put himself out there in, in the first. Episode. To be fair, did you see those tits? Yeah, oh, yeah. those are, show, those were it like should be sculpted. Out, this show shows more restraint than most HBO shows because it's episode True. two where we get the tits. So yes, you know. yeah, yeah. Like, um, my God, and Russ pointed out later that she's like a young-looking Maggie, though. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, those are some of the things that are going on with with Marty. Um, we know he drinks too much. And he passes it off as, I need to do these things for my family because of my work. This right. is how I let all that go so I can go home and be a good family man. Right. He rationalizes yeah. you know, yeah. his bad behavior. So it's he like, excuses a lot, of, yeah. a lot of behavior for himself. There was one bit back when Dora Lang's uh, mother, this was one of the clues that people jumped on right away, is we see a picture of Dora from, it must have been the mid-80s, uh, surrounded by the career de, Mar de Mardi Gras. By yeah. five, five guys on horses. Mm -hmm. And everybody throughout the whole series thought five guys. Every time we saw five guys, it's five yeah. guys. Uh -huh. You know, that she's, oh, she was part of it, you know. Uh -huh. But I think she was just with the career to Mardi Gras. Yeah, and then, um, and so Marty asks Rust about his mom. Is, is your mom still alive? And he says, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned that, um, you know, Rust's family life wasn't that good. Mom left, I think mom left them. Mom left him with dad. Dad took him to Alaska, Alaska and mm -hmm. never got along with his dad anyway. Um, so, uh, let's see, what else do I have written down here? Oh, yeah, did you guys notice that they're in Rust's apartment and he has a mirror about the size of a quarter yes. on his wall? They said that was a uh, McConaughey came up with that. And they really? never... According to the pizza latte, McConaughey came up with this idea. It was a part of his method. Yeah. For Cole, he, he they uh, um, is very funny. They, uh, uh, Woody Harrelson says that he went really method with Cole. He was kind mm -hmm. of he was edgy. He was an asshole, uh -huh. and he was standing looking in that little mirror, like you know, a, a corner of a, of a hologram, just to see one part of his eye. Yeah, and uh, and McConaughey had this long speech about how he transformed the different times of the character when he was older and when he was younger. He had to go through different head spaces and. <laughs> And Harlson said, all I did was take off my wig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's true. Woody was pretty much the same guy. Marty was the same yeah. same Marty, just older. Um, right. But I thought it, it's cool. I love when they do things like that and they never explain it in the show. You just see him looking mm -hmm. into it. And then there's a scene where Marty tries it. He's like, so what do I look in it with one eye? Or <laughs> Are you supposed to be able to see you with both eyes or what? Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit of... Um, that's why I love. I made a. I made a comment on the Facebook page about um, uh, Quentin Tarantino. How why I love so many of his things that he does. Um, in Glorious Bastards, Lieutenant Aldo Rain has this thick scar all the way around his yes. neck, and they never explain it. Right. They no. never tell you why it's there or where it is, but it's there. And I mean, that's makeup. That's hours in the chair and makeup. That's every every day he has to get that put around his neck. So it's not accidental. It's not. Evidently, he was saved from a hanging. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it yeah. seems like. Yeah. The Nazis were trying to hang him. Yeah. So anyway, okay. He looks at the quarter in in, in one eye, and we never get that explained. And um, <laughs> so let's see, Marty. Talked about he, he excuses his good old, old boy lifestyle as, right. uh, you know, he's doing it for the family. Uh, and he says, you got to decompress in, in his interview in 2012. He's talking to these two other right. cops, like, and he's still excusing himself. Well, he asks, you know, I, I, didn't you, either of you guys have an ex-wife? And the first guy's like, no. And the other guy's like, one. He's like, how many ex-wives do you have? Yeah. He's like, one. He's like, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Were mistakes made? Were mistakes made? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure. So um, then, he, yeah, he has a, uh, an affair with a hot young court stenographer, and that, that goes badly because he's now he's obsessive about her. He can't possibly be in love with her. Um, right. He's, he's the obsessive type. Well, did you notice that he warns her that there's a that there are more bodies that they haven't told people about? He's this was trying part, to get her to stay. Well, in this this was out. one of the conspiracy theories. People were like, he knows about other killings, and, and he's not no. telling them. It's like, no, uh -huh. he's trying to scare her so she won't go out. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. But it was it was one of those things where like, everything they did had kind of like there was a conspiracy interpretation, and there was a 
you know, innocent. Auckland's razor really. Oh yeah. <laughs> came, came out true for this totally. one. And one thing that comes out is Russ tells the interviewers that he was admits that he was uh, he was drug trafficking for four years. Yeah, in his undercover, which is mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. It's imp- oh, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what they say. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. But it was because he had uh, they lost his daughter, right? Right, yeah. and he went through. And he went, also he he killed the guy, the junkie. He for, killed the dealer for injecting his, his own daughter. Own right, and so daughter. his choices yeah. were jail or. Undercover, or undercover. Deep, deep undercover guy. And there ain't no, no. What, it, what do you say? There's no expiration date. Mm-hmm. There ain't no expiration date, baby. <laughs> and there, he was talking about it with Marty, and Marty said, usually like 11 months is the most you would do that, and then you're wiped, you're done. Right. And this is, you know, more insight into why Mar- uh, Russ is so damaged. Well, have you guys right. ever seen Rush? Jennifer, the, the yes. Jason. Oh, yeah. Jennifer, Jason, yeah, Z, yeah. Jason Patrick? No. Uh, it's based a, on true story. Based on true story. Yeah. Oh, 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 Gary. Yes. Oh, right. You got to really see good. Rush. You okay. got to see Rush. Good uh, music too. Uh, true story about uh, two undercover cops partners who ended up falling in love while being on the job. They were, but they were portraying boyfriend girlfriend dealers, and they keep trying to make a big deal. But it's like you're coming in here asking to buy like ten thousand dollars worth of coke <laughs> in this little podunk town. Clearly, you're cops, you know. Yeah, so yeah. they have all this trouble, and they are, they're undercover for it was like two years. And they become addicted. And they become drugs. addicted, and right. they go insane. You know, drug dealers aren't stupid. They make them shoot well oh, right yeah. after buying yeah. to prove right. they're addicts. Like, ugh. right. So anyway, um, okay. And then we have Rust still hallucinating because he's he's had brain damage from all the drugs he's had to do. Yeah. Um, I love that hallucination scene. And there's yeah, there's the hallucination a, scene is great. He's a driving. Scene where they're looking for a brothel and Russ just totally beats the shit out of these. Yeah, 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 I'm coming to that. Oh, <laughs> sorry, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the hallucination scene is great. He's driving yeah. his truck, and this is like the most attention we see him pay through the whole thing. His eyes yeah. are yeah. his yeah. eyes are wide open, white knuckle in the steering wheel, and his lips are. That was a great acid flashback. It felt really. <laughs> that's what it looks like. With the tracers. Uh, well, and, that's what full on being on acid looks, looks like. like. Really, Jason? Please tell us more. I yes. understand from the literature. Oh. <laughs> I saw a movie where a guy had an acid flashback. So well, not flashbacks. Yeah. Uh, the, the, but uh, flashbacks are kind of not real things. But the trip. actual the actual trip looks like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So um, we also find out that uh, Rust's files are still sealed. Right, and uh, hence the the Fed rumors, and he's, they say you want to talk about that. And he says, "Shit, why not?" <laughs> and uh, that's when we find out about his background in, in the in the high density drug traffic. Yes, high something. density drug trafficking area. Yes. So he's down. He's out talking to prostitutes. He seems to have kind of a soft spot for uh, for prostitutes. No, he doesn't take advantage of them. He you know he says he's not going to you know I'd never bust them for. You know, prostituting. Right. Um, the one that sells him the pills says, "You know, I thought you were just going to take him." And he says, "Nah, I'd never do that." In fact, he, she says to him, "You seem dangerous." He says, "Of course, I'm dangerous. I'm police. I can do terrible <laughs> things to people with impunity." Well, that, that, that was wonderful. Good. I love that line. Uh, what good. this was, highlights that when, once we see Marty, because we didn't really see Marty's dark side in the first episode. Once yeah. we start seeing that Marty's you know, not, you know, who he's really representing himself to be, what I liked was. Cole comes off as more of an asshole and a jerk in a lot of ways, but he's honest yeah. and fair right. to mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. to the point where they really wish he wasn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you uh-huh. know? Can you treat me a little unfairly? It'd be nice. Yeah. And, well, and, the thing about Marty, too, Marty has a thing about, remember the, the scene where they went out to the bunny farm and the underage girl, and he was really upset about that? Right. So right. she's not 18. He's, he's the guy who... He'll beat somebody's ass for having sex with someone who's 17 years and 360 days. Right, right. But right. he'll fuck her on her 18th birthday. Right, and exactly. A week later. Regardless later. of being married. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, anyway, they're, they're still looking for... Um, they hear about this bunny farm from, um, from the prostitute that, that um, Russ buys his drugs from. Uh-huh. They go looking for it, and these two poor guys, I mean, all, the, all they wanted was they went to night school to learn small motor repair. Uh, right. <laughs> And um, and they go in and this, they um, they ask if they know where this bunny farm is. Nah, we don't know where it is. All right, thank you. Russ comes back and he's oh, this is so cool. Yeah, yeah. Now, we learn also that Russ knows Aikido. Yes, and um, 
there were there were a couple of other early indicators, like when they were in the rock locker room. The locker room. Well, did you know you know how my wife's pussy's supposed to smell? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is another Marty trying to twist what right. they both knew was going on into something it wasn't. Right. right. He had been out with this young. Yeah, hottie. it's like no, I, I'm Although, not stupid. Yeah. Also <laughs> foreshadowing. Well, I, I can actually. I don't know if you were already planning on using this quote, but there was a, ru- a quote from episode two that kind of rolled into my episode, but it says uh, from Cole, I mean, from Marty, saying, Rust has as sharp an eye for weakness as I've seen. Yeah. The problem is he realizes that Cole can see him too. Yeah. Right. And he don't like being seen. Right. He likes being slick. Yeah, yeah. Yep. and his bullshit works on everybody except it doesn't work on Rust. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they go into the mo- the uh, lawnmower repair shop, and, and they leave because they didn't get the information they want. Rust goes back in, and this is, you know, all martial arts have some variation of whacking a guy in the head with a toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. No, that wasn't, that wasn't. <laughs> but what he did to the other guy was he, he took... And he, he started to throw him one way, and then he reversed that momentum and threw him on his back on uh-huh. the table. And that's oh, yeah. Aikido. And then the handhold where he's he's holding his hand, what he's doing is he's digging his thumb into a nerve on the back of the hand, and it hurts like hell. And yeah. he will scream like a little girl. Marty was, act, when he was doing it to Marty, Marty was acting tough like, you know, he wanted right. to scream. No, he... You scream and you don't care who sees. Mm-hmm. Right. It hurts that bad. Um, I bet it does. <laughs> so anyway, so Rust found out where the bunny farm is. They go see. Um, they go find out. They get a they get a box of stuff that belonged to Dora, and right. her yearbook is in there, and also a diary. And that's where we start finding out, out about the Yellow King and, and Carcosa. Carcosa. Yeah. Carcosa, yeah. Uh, and did. I, I, I didn't know what that was until the internets came up with, um, you know, it was a literary No, uh, yeah, I from, Googled that right away, yeah. you know. Uh, I had not know, I didn't know what Carcosa was. And then I'm like, well, it can't be, it can't be this story in their world because mm-hmm. they'll just find out about it. Yeah. Right, so, yeah, it's got to be that they're in one of these stories. Yeah, okay, so um, we did find out about, uh, we talked about already about Rust's, um, his experience in the in the narco thing, he got right, shot right. three times. Everybody, all his old buddies that he was undercover with, his his crime buddies thought he was dead because he had disappeared after he got shot three times. Uh, and then, uh, did you catch the bit where so Marty he's got the underage girl there and he gives her a hundred bucks and says go do something else? Yeah, and then, right. And then Cole's like, yeah. "What was that down payment?" Yeah, no. so it's like, can you be any more of a can dick? Can you be more of a dick? Yeah. But it. Kind of turned out to be true. Kind of turned out to be true. It's also foreshadowing. It's also foreshadowing. Exactly. She had an even better body than the first one. (laughs) There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Marty's got a... Talk about the eye for human weakness. He's got an eye for women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, then they go... For some reason, they're at Maggie's parents, and you can tell that neither of them want to be there or like the parents. Hmm. And uh, Marty comes up. You know, Maggie's dad is one of these old-time conservative who... Looks like he's pretty wealthy. Right. It's kind of interesting because uh, you would think that Mr. Good Old Boy uh, Marty there would, would be like hemming and hawing it up yeah. with him. I actually was like, well, this is an interesting layer to Marty. Yeah, yeah. He there is like something him. underneath. Yeah, because he's rejecting this. He was but, very progressive. You know what's yeah. funny about that yeah. though? He's the dad is saying, you know, the kids today they wear too much makeup and yeah. it's all about sex. That's exactly what happens to Marty's daughter. Right. So right, yeah. he's uh, kind of right. Kind of right. <laughs> well, yeah. There's, well, they were sexualized early on. At least the older one was somehow. They were. Right. She was drawing the. Well, that's you know, one of the sex. big things, and we actually have. Uh, I think it's in the next. See, that was cast. never really we have some quest- We have some questions about Audrey. Yeah. That'll mm-hmm. in part that we'll cover in part two the from our from our listener okay. feedback. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Getting ahead of myself. Sure. <laughs> okay, and then I've only got just a couple of other really cool Rust quotes. Let's see. Um, oh yeah, the hubris it must take to yank a soul out of non-existence into this meat, <laughs> to force a life into this thresher. Oh, he doesn't sound like a serial killer at all. No, not at all. Meat thresher. <laughs> or a fatalist. Or... He actually says at one point. Well, maybe you have to quote about his daughter. This is an important safety tip. When you're talking to the police about serial crime, try to avoid the phrase meat thresher. Yeah. <laughs> and then these three guys get sent down from um, from 
state or wherever. The oh, government. the task force. This yeah. is Tuttle's task force. Yeah, Tuttle's right. task force, and he's a dick to them too. He says, uh, "Xerox all you want, boys, will make you feel like real cops. Yeah, <laughs> make you feel yeah. like good cops." It's almost he's almost like an old timey sarcastic cop from a film noir. Yeah, okay. yeah. almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Except, yeah. I've been playing L.A. noir, and there's a lot of dialogue like that. You know, James Elroy stuff. Mm. Um, well, if you didn't, uh, do you have anything else there? Because uh, no. I, I think I have the only well, one. You know, we, there's we, an, we another nice hallucination when, or maybe it isn't when right. Hus, Rust sees the birds. The spiral, spiral. Oh, yeah. spiral. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Are they starlings? Is that the birds? That, I, I'm not sure. That's the birds one that are. actually that one really looks like what it looks like in a hallucinogen because you see patterns that you don't normally discern, uh-huh. right? So like. Uh, you'll like you'll see the neg- you'll look at something and see the negative space as the positive space or something weird like that. So you would totally see that interference pattern and, and interpret it as a spiral, even if it wasn't. Mm. You know, and he's just like, oh no, I know it wasn't real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, Nick Pizzolatto said that there's no no surreal no um supernatural supernatural stuff going on. So right. we're left to assume that it was a another hallucination. Hallucination. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then they're in the burned out church. They finally you know they go looking for this church and this guy. Um, that uh, Dora had started going to, and they end up in this burned out church. And right. See the picture on the wall of the, you know, with antler the lady, boobs, boobs. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, the only other details I got is uh, we we find out that he had a relationship with Lori, uh, that almost became a marriage. All right, so we know That's that right. he had one relationship that we were first. Now is that the one that um that Maggie introduced mm-hmm. him to? Yeah, the, the doctor. doctor. Yeah, yeah. But so we this don't is know. in the years after Dora. Oh, okay. right. Yeah. And then, uh, and I have my my uh, Russ Cole quote was: she articulated a personal vision. Vision has meaning. Meaning is historical. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and, then, and then Marty's like, what the hell? Yeah, exactly. Marty's like nodding. Mm, okay. okay, whatever. All right, I think that's it. Uh, so um, let, uh, let's uh, let's hit it a little more listener feedback, shall we? Yes. Um, and I want to apologize if you guys have heard little funny sounds. Um, Tyrion, the new dog, is being a pain in the butt. <laughs> Anyways, so this question was, what did you think of Maggie's story? Um, the first one is Larkin Walken, who's out in Walnut Creek. Hi, neighbor. Hey. Hey. I didn't like Maggie, just on a sheer gut level reaction to her. She reminded me of another balls buster, Skylar from Breaking Bad. Didn't like her either. Mm. Both oh. ladies struck me as being sanctimonious. Well, both yeah, ladies are dealing earned, with difficult situations. I See, I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, maybe it's me, but I have sympathy for both of them. I did yeah. too. I, I did just, too. I thought like... <laughs> one's got a meth dealer husband, one's got a philandering husband who's I guess if you, I, I guess, I mean, in, in, in terms of like if you're enjoying a narrative and you're like kind of projecting about how this bad boy can do all this crazy stuff and you kind of fun up fan fantasy is oh i wish i could get away yeah, with this shit yeah. mm. so then the characters that speak reason hey you exactly. know we we need you to you know not kill people <laughs> right not right. cook meth yeah. or at least give us some account not th- for where you're going for five yeah, hours at maybe time, right? you know? have a job you know, <laughs> right. you know? I, I don't really see that as ball busting. No, um, and certainly not for maggie i think there was less of that because it's not like marty's doing these great adventures that we really want him to win on <laughs> well, we want yeah. to solve the cage. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah we yeah. do. But she, I think he definitely. But they're, they're like that. they're like the party poopers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But only in fantasy land. Right. In real life, they would make a lot of sense. Yes. Sure. Kevin Sterling, she never bugged me one bit. Marty's a lecher who vowed he'd never cheat again. He comes home, washes his own clothes, takes a shower, and leaves his phone out in the open. What a dope! <laughs> Maggie nailed Rust. Then, ru- then nailed Marty to the wall. She exacted the perfect revenge. Mm. Marty was Maggie's third child. I love that line. I mm. made sure to... Ah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Ouch. Then Hannah Loveless Paul Al. She was a smart woman who signed on to her marriage as a partner. And when Marty made it impossible for her to believe that they were still partners, she confronted him. No whining, just laid it out for him. She gave him every opportunity to... T- be telling the truth and the minute she found out he was lying the whole time she did not whimper to her friends she left Mm -hmm. 
When Russ and Marty reunite in 2012, they didn't even bring her up until way into the conversation. And even then, she's basically dismissed by both men. There is no way she was the big betrayal between the two men. And I feel almost ashamed for Maggie that we got to see that and she doesn't even know. She was one of my favorite characters, even though I judge her pretty harshly for what she did to Rust. She had all the signs that Matthew pointed out above, but uh, refused to hear what he was saying. Yeah, this was in a thread. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she did use Rust. Yeah. And she yeah. was going to go right back to Marty and say, I fucked Rust. Yeah. So yeah. that was yeah, dirty. That was, uh, yeah. that was really dirty. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, I think she was very valid in everything she yeah. did and the way she handled herself. It just, you know, if you're, if you're like getting off on the bad boy thing, it's like, oh, party pooper. Um, Barbara Richard, I think Maggie gets a lot of hate because, and this is not an easy admission, I felt territorial toward a wounded man. He asked her, what are you doing? And she said, to be honest with me. After all she said and done, the honesty she asked for was a duplicitous ploy at his emotional expense. I would be wise to remember that this was simply an eight-week run of make-believe and not people in real life. <laughs> However, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. true. true. It's, it's, I think it's just about you know who the party pooper characters are, and they always tend to be women. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's sad because it really mm-hmm. makes women look like such harpies, and they're not yeah. necessarily. Solange says, It seems to me that Maggie and Russ clicked, not necessarily sexually, but initially more empathetically. They were connected right away, five minutes in. In the mowing my lawn scenario, before Mm -hmm. Marty comes in and all gangbusters with jealous lawnmower rage, it was the first time in the entire series that we saw Russ with an open expression and anything at all resembling a smile or a glimpse of his tender humanity. Mm. All of Maggie's machinations to get Russ hooked up with her friends were in part wanting to see him healed, fulfilled, and also, in her part, living vicariously through those couplings. She felt connected to Rust in a profound way from the outset, and it was another way for her to connect. I utterly understand why she went for him for her revenge sex. She was so out of her mind, so desperate, but not enough out of her head to bang a stranger from a bar. Um, Although I think if she banged a stranger from a bar, that would have been a little bit yeah. soft to revenge. And do we have some, we have some good listener feedback Aren't they on smart? Yeah, yeah. These are some smart people. You know, the lawnmower, you, the you mowed my lawn scene, yes. as ridiculous as that is, it works in one of those that's overstepping your bounds. Yes. Especially when this is my oh, territory. Have you guys seen the clip from Kingpin? No. It's Woody Harrelson, and he punches a guy out and says, you never mow another man's lawn. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's a, oh. he had one hand. Yeah, the one hand is the yeah. bowler. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, funny. anyway, sorry. And Jackie Burgett. I felt that Rust was drawn to Maggie at first because she seemed easy to talk to, showed respect and compassion towards him without being patronizing. I don't think at first it was a sexual thing, but during the seven years they developed a bond, as it were. Rust's relationship with Lori must have been lacking somehow. Lori's vacant stare at TV, just going through the channels with the remote. Rust watching her, knowing there was an emptiness there. I would have thought at least one episode might give insight to their relationship. Yeah, that was... It was, yeah. <laughs> There's actually a missing, uh, 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 a deleted clip where you see Lori and, and uh, Rust break up and when it's over. Oh, really? So they got accidentally it? released to the internet, so they've been taking it down. It's going to be part of the oh. Blu-rays. Oh, okay. uh, but basically, it's over with kids. He doesn't want to have kids. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, because yeah, so. yeah, they, they, the only time we see them together, they say how perfect they are together. So did I you saw make that anything? somehow, too. Did you make was, anything of her being a doctor? D- it definitely. D- well, intellectual I mean, equals. Yeah. Intellectual equals. She was yeah, really yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, yeah. she had his, his number. Yes, personally. definitely. Um, okay, I think we're about almost ready for episode three, but first let's get a little bit more, a little more sample of the show. And here we go. And they saw in that last nanosecond, they saw what they were. That you, yourself, this whole big drama, it was never anything but a jerry rig of presumption and dumb will. And you could just let go. Finally know that you didn't have to hold on so tight. To realize that all your life, 
They heard all your love, all your hate, all your memory, all your pain. It was all the same thing. It was all the same dream, a dream that you had inside a locked room. A dream about being a person. Sound yeah, the cool. sound design in the show well, was and then it goes insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. that Inception Wong starts to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well, I believe we have Miss Ekite. So that was definitely a good roll in because the uh, title of episode three is The Locked Room. The deeper uh, Hart and Cole investigate the Dora Lang murder, the more we see Russ's ability to find and exploit defects in people. Yep. And. Um, Cole pokes and prods at the psychological failings of others. And we see this happen when he uses the language of faith to um, gently cause a sex offender to break down and be ready to confess to absolutely anything they tell him to. Mm. And then um, also when we see um, Hart losing his shit over uh, Cole mowing his lawn. Yeah. So we're really seeing a lot of that going on this this episode, and it's this episode to me is a lot of it is about neither of them practicing what they preach, right? And um, uh, you know, Hart's hypocritical view on morality, and um, Cole's nihilistic views on the world, and uh, when we shoot from ninety five to two thousand and twelve, we see. Cole before really wasn't living the uh, wasn't fully ready for that solitude life that he is now. Right, he's clearly living it now. Um, because we see, you know, although he, you know, is resistant to being around other people and like the family dinner and meeting girls and stuff like that. When he gets in that situation back in '95, then he does roll with it and he's like, "Wait a minute, this isn't so bad." Whereas in 2012, he's just shut down and he's totally a yeah. Uh, recluse or whatever um an old drunk and uh, (laughs) my notes jump a little bit sorry um and then uh, they're also in this episode they're getting pressure to turn the case over to the task force and hart and cole locate the pastor of the burnt down church and the evangelist name is joel theriot 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 and we learn Dora was often seen um in the presence of a tall man with facial scarring Mm mm-hmm and Hart begins to reconnect with Maggie, um, but also, you know, goes and beats the crap out of Lisa's new boyfriend. Before we get away jealous. from the Reverend, though, uh, Sorry. I want to point out this is something. I, uh, so I had an article for IO9 deconstructing Cole, and part of it is uh, about Reverend uh, Therio. Mm-hmm. Out, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on the show, you just see a couple of random lines that just seem like ordinary Jesus y talk. But over at uh, darknessbecomesyou.com and also on YouTube, they have the complete uncut version of that sermon. And it's actually a fairly complicated theological thesis that Mm. mirrors all of Cole's philosophy. Hmm. So all of Cole's Hmm. whole thing about... You know, time is a flat circle, and you're trapped in eternity, and you're going to live your life again and again, and all this other stuff has this positive. Ex- say those those same ideas are expressed by the minister, only he says at the end of all of it, God will show you your true self, and you'll you'll you, everything that all the all the sorrows of your life will make sense. Right, mm. right, and it foreshadows all the ultimate ending that Cole has. You know, uh, at, at the end of the show, but I highly recommend going and watching that that because it's uh, in the show. When you go back and watch it, because I was like, when I saw it online, I'm like, I don't remember all of this incredible no, yeah. talk. And then you mm-hmm. go back, and it's not there. You know, so right. got to see it online. Please go online, hmm. check that out. Hmm. For cool, it's good. Also, I, I like the cynical debate that the two characters have when they go into the the revival meeting. That's pretty great. You know, safe to say nobody's going to be splitting the atom here, Marty. Yeah. (laughs) That's so mean, but it is. uh, She texts us up on your high horse. Right. Right. Okay. And then we also see Cole putting his insomnia to good use by um, spending long nights going through DB files for cases that are similar to Dora. Mm -hmm. And he stumbles upon Rianne Oliver 
and she was listed as an accidental drowning victim, but she has a lot of the same cuts and um, injuries and and the tattoo and all that as Dora Lang. Yeah. Um, but because it was at the same time as uh, I think one of the hurricanes Andrew or something, or, Andrew or something. Yeah. Andrew. Um, they just put it down that she had drowned, and you know, once you find a body and it's bloated, you can't really tell exactly what happened a lot of the time too. Well, so they tested her for LSD. Right. That's Why okay. Now it? this is this is oh, excuse me, bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there is to to test for LSD, you have to test the spinal fluid and you have to be looking for acid mm. and it's so like you find some body in a river you're not going to go <laughs> testing yeah. it for lsd yeah. unless you have a lot of lsd tests lying around yeah. uh, so mm. anyway but yeah anyway. you'd have to have a reason to be looking for yeah. it um so they go out into the bayou to meet with her grandfather ran oliver's grandfather and they find out that she attended the light of the way academy which is one of the schools that was run by uh, tuttle's organization um and then we find out she ran off with Reggie Ledoux. Reggie Ledoux. Reggie Ledoux. Um, so they then head over to the closed school and they meet a man uh, on the lawnmower there. And he's just a little too silver tongued and a little. Um, yeah. But then uh, Hart, who's still in the car, gets a call and sends them in the direction of trying to find Reggie Ledoux. And, and again, can I say, our group, you know, immediately. When that episode, it's like, why did we spend so much time talking to the lawnmower guy? Uh-huh. Right. You know, there's, everyone was like, he didn't give us any information, and we have to, we're walking back and forth. Even Marty's like, who walks that goddamn slow? Yeah. You know, right. and so it's like, clearly we're supposed to pay attention to the lawnmower man, and he's not giving us anything really useful. So. And right. when Marty's trying to get Cole's attention to get him back to the car, mm-hmm. Cole, like, doesn't quite want to leave. He's just, something's not quite right here, and he just was a little unsettled. Right. But then that get him t- got him turned well, into another direction. What's so ironic is he, he told the detectives, I, mean, I have to have my big ledger so I can draw everything because some details going to escape you. And then later on he says he missed the scars on this guy's face because he had dirt and a beard. Yeah. Right. And See, it's like if I had spent another two seconds looking, I might have noticed that your face was scarred. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So they find out that Ledoux skipped parole and he was a former cellmate of uh, Dora Lang's husband, Charlie. So they go back and, and question Charlie again. And they put an APB out on Ledoux. Um, and then... Is there anything else major we want to cover here? Uh, we'll get uh, Audrey. Yeah. There's, there's Audrey's oh, picture. Oh, yeah. Audrey. Drama. Audrey, yeah. yeah. So they have the uh, situation with um, the older daughter of uh, Marty and Maggie. And the drawings that she was making at school and the creepy Barbie doll stuff she was doing and and this whole part of the plot is just really frustrating with me because it doesn't really seem like it played out right and, and again in our in our subsequent episode we have our listener feedback on Audrey and that whole right. thing and, and mm-hmm. I think it was a weakness in the story that mm-hmm. where it was a clear setup that was obvious how you could play it out and then mm-hmm. they didn't go there. Right. Sure. I just don't understand why they wasted time um, doing all that. And then but uh, the scene after that uh, where he puts down the book and then Maggie starts pressuring him and we start seeing the way that Marty operates with his hustle. He deflects mm. so incredibly. Mm-hmm. He's, all, he's like a master at fucking bullshit. Mm. Right? And so she's like, she's like trying to pin him down. She's very vague too the way she speaks so you don't really know what she's talking about or it's marriage talk so you don't really know or whatever, right? But then he starts... Spinning this line that no woman in her right mind would buy. Mm. I feel I'm almost forty. I feel like the coyote. I'm mm-hmm. gonna fall. I'm just trying to hold on, and it's just he just it's just random generic. That was like, such bullshit. Yeah. It, well, it's like an artificially intelligent robot that's giving you a default reaction because it can't <laughs> right. understand uh-huh. what you asked for. It's like, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. I would have just wanted to look him in the eye and go, "Do you really believe your bullshit?" Well, she did say that to him before. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, but now she's looking at him like you, she bought the coyote line. They end up having like you know uh, Nicholas sex. Rogue kind of sex yeah. with the mm-hmm. up close well, up. <laughs> also, this scene makes Maggie unlikable in that she almost immediately blames him for what their daughter did with the drawings. It's, or sort of blames him. It's like, right. well, it's because you're not here. Really? I, I, no. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, uh, there, so there was that. Yeah. Uh, other stuff to cover was... Uh, Before I hit the last scene. Uh, well, uh, they, uh, they, they have... Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then, in, and then in 2012, we get a little more insight into as to why the episode is titled The Locked Room. Because uh, Cole says he's gained entry into the locked room that holds the secret to human perception, and is now convinced that is nothing that in, that inside is nothing more than a dream of being a person. Right. 
that's that was the yeah, the little audio they played. Yeah. Dream of being a person. Um, and then uh, there, there's another bit I, I really liked where they were at, they're having the spring rolls, and mm-hmm. they're talking about they've only got like well, two days left, and he's like, well, let's go digging through all the DBs and do all this. He's like, I don't, we don't have the hours, mm-hmm. and you're kind of myopic and a little obsessive, and, <laughs> and he says, well, you're obsessive, right. just not about the job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we see the real friction between these two characters and, mm-hmm. and, and the personal level that's getting to. They're throwing back at each other's personal lives a little, right. a little bit more. Um, and, then the, and then my quote of the week I had found online, I thought was a good one somebody had posted, was, uh, Marty, you know the real difference between you and me? Rust. Yeah, denial. <laughs> Marty, the difference is that I know the difference between the idea and a fact. Mm-hmm. You are incapable of admitting, admitting doubt. Now that sounds like denial to me, Rust. I doubt I that. I doubt that. Yeah, that was that's, that's the spring roll scene. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, oh, and then we find out there's a there, when he's talking to Lawnmower Man, we find out about the Tuttle School connection. We make sure that that's the, the right. Tuttle schools. And the only other thing is we we see Cole uh, Maggie sets him up with a girl. They go dancing right at the, right, bar. At the bar. Yeah, and that's where. And again, that's where we see he's he acts like he's. He preaches that he's, you know, like anti-human <laughs> connection. Right. But when a human connection really reaches out to him, he snags onto it. Oh, yeah. No, he well, protests too much, and, and Peace Lotus has, has said in, that. In 95, in 2012, he doesn't, but... Well, the girl... The and girl he knew how to his, dance. Yeah, yeah, but the girl that was his date, he, he hardly looked at her when he was talking to her. Even when they were dancing, mm-hmm. he, he had his hand kind of on the small of her back, but his fingers were splayed back, so he wasn't, you know... It was really awkward, embracing. Yeah. He was kind of awkward. He wasn't looking at her. He was, you know, answering her questions, not really asking her anything. But he definitely craves meaning and connection while right. d- deriding meaning and right. connection, mm. yeah. uh, I think. Absolutely. And I had one more thing here. Oh, yeah. You know, in that date, he's talking to about synesthesia. So we know that he has, he has oh, right. synesthesia. Yeah. yeah. So he tastes colors and he smells music and stuff like that. And did you uh, notice she says, so if something feels good, it'll feel yeah. extra good? <laughs> flirty. Yeah, flirty that, that was, uh, that, was that got my flirty. attention. And while that's going on, Marty's casing on his mistress. And yes. So. Oh yeah. Did, wait, so, was this the episode obviously. where we got the beat down on her? Yeah. Not. Uh, yeah, I think it is actually. Yeah, it's not episode, episode four. Yeah. yeah he breaks into her up. his girlfriend's apartment. Right. And beats, beats up the, the boyfriend. boyfriend. Right. right. The guy, I, mean, I covered know? that. And then he says, "I don't do this. I'm not a psycho." Right. So that's when everybody on our board was like, "Oh no, okay, it's not Rust. It's going to be Marty for yeah, sure because he right. beat somebody up." You know? yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you know we have the final scene that we all think we're having Breaking Bad flashbacks, mm-hmm. where we see <laughs> what we li- later find out is Reggie Ledoux in his underwear and a gas mask walking through the grass so in that a bayou was... with a machete. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sasquatch. And, gas and, mask. and there's the. The most dreams have a monster. Monster at the, the end, end. Yeah. right? That's there right. he is. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was pretty great. All right, uh, I think we're just about ready to move over to episode four, but we got a little bit more audio. Are we, are we done with listener feedback? Do we get all the way through? Okay, good. All right, so we're done with that. So we're gonna do a little audio. So uh, audio is fun tonight. I like that. Yeah. yeah, I'm loving this audio thing. We got a job to do. Off book. It's the only thing I can think of. I, I gotta straighten out things with the family. I, I gotta fix it. That bike club. I know him. Had deals with him when I work in Narco. We can get to that motherfucker, Ledoux. So, enough with the self-improvement, penance, hand-wringing shit. Let's go to work. Do you think you're... Fuck. Hell of a bedside man you got rushed. Uh, you know, being stupid is different than calling in sick, and this is a bar, not a fucking bedside. <laughs> Friend in need. Tom, I think you hit a ceiling and you just keep raising the bar. You are like the Michael Jordan of being a son of a bitch. Come on, baby. Really, I love this jacket I got. And Marty's loving it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Marty's like, yeah, finally, someone's going to take me to some crazy shit. <laughs> All right, episode four, my episode man Andrew. Episode four uh, is Who Goes There? And... I'm lucky enough to introduce what is probably the best episode, in my opinion, in the whole show. And uh, certainly the most unusual, in that up to this point, the settings have been mostly Louisiana swamps and bayous, whenever they're in exteriors anyway. Mm -hmm. And here, suddenly we're plunged into the inner city. And also, uh, up to this point, most of the violence in the show has been brief, or it's just something, an aftermath. Here we get 
extreme violence. We get serious beatdowns and shootouts. So it's it's a very unusual episode. But and of course, it's notable mainly for the amazing six minute shot that yeah. comes at the end. Oh right, we'll yeah, get to that shot. later. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty incredible. Anyway, but it opens up with uh, Charlie in jail, and uh, here we that our two heroes go to interview him, and he. They find out about Reggie being his cellmate, and sure enough, Reggie was talking, was along with being a good drug chemist, was also talking about child satanic sacrifice and the Yellow King and had a spiral on his back. And then we hear the name Tyrone Weems, which becomes important. Mm -hmm. And um, they look, they go to look for him. And uh, actually, it's it's another nice character moment because. Uh, Charlie was incredibly upset when he realizes that he was, by talking about his Dora to uh, Reggie, he may have gotten her killed. Right. And Russ has no sympathy for Charlie. And showing, showing naked pictures of her to other people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, hey, she's my wife. Uh, you know, well, you're, Marty, you're... He, Marty calls him out on that and says, you, you didn't have to make him feel like it was his fault. He says, hey, he asked about himself first before he asked about her. Fuck him. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Because he that's asked good. Like, uh, you going to get me, you know, in yeah, front of a yeah. judge? And... Right. Well, he's alive and Dora's not. I yeah. mean, let's, we have priorities. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, then we see Marty uh, testifying at a case. And, of course, there's Lisa, the court reporter, and also his mistress. Uh, they have an angry fight, and he, you know, blows her off. And, and then... Uh, See then, blah, blah, blah. then well, oh. she she says you can't do this to me Marty I, you, you, know, I, you know you have to respect me and he says this is respect this is respect. and then the elevator yes. closes right in front yeah. of him right yeah it's like eh. yeah. <laughs> and of course elevators are symbols of hell whenever you mm. see the elevator in a movie that's hell so there's hell between these two anyway go on yes anyway so back at the station Rust and uh, Marty talk tell all the officers about Reggie and Tyrone and they're going to look. And eventually they find uh, a woman named Kelly, Kelsey, who's a stripper. So, of course, we have a scene <laughs> in a strip club. Right. <laughs> she, uh, she says she doesn't know Tyrone anymore, but uh, Marty pressures the bartender and finds out, yeah, they're still dating. And the bartender is Nick. There's a lot of... Right. That's kind of a... Oh, himself. it is. Yeah. I didn't know that. He, wrote oh, him, cool. he did not write himself in as the coroner. <laughs> and he um, and uh, Marty even says uh, Harrelson even looks at him across the bar and goes, or something, some line about I can't believe the, the things you make me say. Well, he's oh, gonna, yeah. he threatens to shut him down. Yeah. He's like, oh, do you want me to shut you down? Why do you make me say this? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you make me say this stuff? This, this like, cliche oh, cop dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it's yeah. so well done because there's all this tension. I totally didn't get it. Oh, and, uh, yeah. rewatch it, you'll be laughing. Well, so I, I know the scene exactly. I yeah. didn't know it was Nick though. It's Nick. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. Okay. Kiss me, I'm an asshole. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then uh, Marty comes home and finds his suitcases and a letter from Maggie. She's oh. taken off. Turns out that Lisa called and told her, came actually, came over and told her everything. And he he not only gets home, he gets home and he has his, I've been out fucking all night uniform on. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Tie, tie untied around his neck, jacket yeah. half right. on. That's his look. A guy for. like him would never do a load of laundry in his life. Oh, no. yeah. Unless yeah. he was hiding cum stains from somebody he shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, probably yeah, not, know. no. And then we see in the interview, he's trying to spin his family life to the two police officers. Right. Ah, well, you know, these I'm things. Captain America. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then... He, um yeah. my red, white, and blue tie. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, then he goes back to the strip club, follows the stripper, um, finds Tyrone, asks about Reg- Reggie, and he finds out that Reggie's with a bike club called the Iron Crusaders, and that he cooks meth for them and he tells rust and then it's funny in the interview with the two cops rust says oh i needed personal time to see my dad of course that was a long time ago right i can't really remember the details <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, right it's, yeah. it's one of the better moments where we know right away oh they're totally lying they're both totally lying to these mm-hmm. guys they're both totally lying and also that we we've, we've started to get this sense that they're suspecting rust because right. they keep saying, so he came up with the serial killer. So you yeah. kind of followed his lead on this, you know. And it's like, yeah. okay, you're on to him. Why, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, Marty goes to talk to Maggie at work to try and get her to, you know, 
take him back. And, of course, she doesn't even talk to him. Meanwhile, we get a great shot of Rust pulling out this locker he just happens That's to have awesome. in his room. <laughs> uh. And one of the things that cracks me up is he opens up and it has all these guns and then he pulls out booze. Yes. <laughs> guns and booze guns together. And booze. You know, <laughs> always a good time. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but he has an AK-47 in there. That was that big oh, gun with a yes, banana insane. clip on it. <laughs> oh, heavy anyway. shit. Anyway. <laughs> It's so a, it's a little um, Marty, Hall- Halloween chest. <laughs> Russ comes to help Marty and uh, says he has a line on Reggie. They go to a bar and Rust is not sympathetic to Marty, as we heard in the clip. <laughs> and Rust actually says at one point, all the it, all, you know that Lisa was crazy, and he says all the dick swagger you roll and you can't spot crazy pussy, which <laughs> which is fair comment. <laughs> it, you know, guy, some guys talk like that, not yes. me. But anyway. Um, so, but anyway, in, in what is a bit of a coincidence, but it's okay. It turns out that Rust knows about the bike club, the Iron Crusaders, from his undercover days. Right. And he shows Marty his gun stash, which is pretty <laughs> funny. And then says that his cover is still good with the bike club. They don't know that he's actually a cop. Right. And says that he's going to meet him and he's going to make an offer, some kind of drug deal, to get a line on Reggie. And then, of course, he says... We're going to do this just the two of us. Yeah. So. And that's the part where I was like, bullshit. <laughs> and he, he called, we've got to do this off book. Yeah, yeah. we're going to do this off book. Bullshit. Well, you know what, though? This is another one of those cliches. Almost every cop movie and TV show has a moment when they're like, it, you know, what is it in Bad Boys? Shit just got real. You know, <laughs> yes, they this, always like, okay, we're not cops anymore. Yeah. This is personal. Yeah. They Verily, take a lot the of liberties in becomes actual show. here. Yeah. They take yeah. a lot of liberties in this show, but it's so good you let them go. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 even though they're rural mm-hmm. cops in Louisiana, you can't do this shit. That you can't just no, you can't do this, shit this, this crazy people. ass biker shit. No. You can't, you know, one cop isn't going to unlock the cell so that the other cop can beat the shit out of yeah, the two yeah, kids. Yeah, I would hope that. You have whole careers. Actually, I can believe that more than I can believe the I believe some of that. Uh, yeah, the, the beating the shit out of the two guys I could play. In, they, yeah, they uh, in totally county? Lawyers. Not in county. Totally not not in fucking county. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Anyway. I don't know. But uh, did you catch the bit where he, he's got Russ's jacket on and he opens it up and catches the bullet hole? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. she's so like looking at the bullet Whoa. holes. So you know that Russ's okay. story is not bullshit. Yes, yeah. he was shot. Or he shot his jacket. You know, no, which probably not. <laughs> and then and scarred then, himself up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Russ has a chilling moment where, you know... Uh, he, it, Marty's like, are you sure you want to do this? And Russ talks about, about how there used to be this drug cartel he knew that would tear someone's face off, put a mirror in front of you, and then cut your dick and balls off and shove them down your throat so you see yourself choking to death. He's like, yeah, death's better than that. <laughs> Shot in the head is not a problem. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, it's only shooting. <laughs> and he literally starts injecting himself with ink and cayenne pepper to yep, make his right. skin look into his Hey. Yep. And then they have a funny scene where he goes to the evidence locker and very easily samples and steals some high grade cocaine. Oh, I loved how he's topped to, you know, take <laughs> yeah. a snort. You know, well, every cop show, too, the guy shoves a knife through the bag of cocaine and then just, like, just walks off. Yeah, there's no tape or anything. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, I love how he's sneaking the coke out and he actually says, eh, we should have a better system for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, even he. <laughs> and then. Uh, you know, then Mar- in the interview in the modern day, uh, we find out that his dad actually didn't really have leukemia. So they inter- the two cops are kind of on to him, you know, but he's like, oh, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, oh, Maggie and Russ actually meet and talk about Marty. And, uh, you know, Marty says he wants to see the girls. Russ kind of tries to make up for him. And then uh, he, he has one of his more interesting moments. He's like, oh, you know, men and women don't work at all together except for having children. Yeah. That's and all that's that all matters, we're good Maggie. for. That's all that matters. And then Maggie just like is... Then he's gets his a- purpose then because she's done having babies. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, they have to raise their babies. <laughs> oh, yeah, and yeah. then she says to him, at the end of the day, you duck under rationalizations like the rest of them. You right. must have been a great husband, which is... That was harsh. That was... Yeah, see, again, they're making Maggie almost too much of a bitch, I think. So, anyway. Again, like in most cop movies and TV shows. So then we have a lovely shot of the bayou. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Russ tells Marty he's been around this club for a while. He's They're going to go to a um, biker... The biker bar. The club, yeah. And he gives him a cell phone. 
a 1990s cell phone. Right. And the whole giant, you know, yeah. Gordon Gecko cell phone. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then there's an interesting moment where Russ tells Marty that Maggie's starting to softening and she'll take him back. And it's hard to tell if he's lying or not. He's totally I lying. He's, I think he's lying. Oh, he, he's totally he just lying. wants Marty's head in the game. Absolutely, one hundred percent lying. Yeah, <laughs> but they do eventually get back together. Yeah, no, but it doesn't mean he's wrong. But he's lying. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, okay. Because she didn't tell him anything like that, and they he yeah. left she, her. But she didn't say divorce, as he points out. She never did say the word divorce. Okay, he's he's making it sound better than it is. Probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. He's sugarcoating it just yeah. to get him back in the game. Because he said, because then they make a point of it. Marty's like, "Is that your honest read?" He's like, "That's my honest yeah, read." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, totally. Away. It's the only. I think it's the only time we actually see Cole lie. I think, huh. aside from uh, uh, undercover stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm going. I'm uh, going to visit my dad with leukemia. <laughs> no, no, no. With but in the relationship, in the in the. Oh, those two guys. As, yeah, as characters, yeah, he's lying, probably. lying about the cover ups and those things, but not just just a personal lie. A moment where he just yeah, he lies just day to day. That's not his mo. That's not his mo. Yeah. <clears throat> So anyway, so then they go to the very scary, shadowy uh, biker bar where we see these slow motion shots of these huge spooky bikers. It's a little over the top, I think, but I guess there probably are places like this. What do I know? Anyway, so he goes in to make a drug deal and uh, he meets Ginger, whom he used to know back in the day who thought he was dead. Right. And they kind of bond. And uh, he comes up with a nice cover story on why these... uh, Mexican soldiers need the meth. Right. And it's actually pretty smart. And he and Ginger, of course, likes the high quality coke. And uh, but then he said he he wants Russ to come with him on this raid they're going on. And uh, Russ tries to get out of it, but Ginger's like, "Well, come on, you got to do this. What are you a pussy now? The whole thing." Right. Right. Usual macho thing. Meanwhile, Marty goes into the bar, looks completely out of place, makes a complete <laughs> idiot of himself. With a Pink yeah. Floyd t-shirt on. Right, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. I bar. love Marty coming into the bar. <laughs> well, also, he's like, uh, he, I'm his sponsor. He might go off the wagon. He might yeah, go right. off the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then he goes back to the... Uh, um, Rust goes back to the biker's hideout. Yeah. And it turns out that they have this black drug dealer named Tiger from the projects hide in the closet and they're going to force him to tell where his money is in right. the in the projects and they have cop uniforms on um, <laughs> you know that'll work except of course ginger has like a 10 foot beard which right. is so <laughs> not regulation you know come on but they no no man he's zz cop yeah, yeah. <laughs> zz cop yeah no i thought they were going to put the uniforms on marty because he you know, he the cleanest looks cut apart of them. more. Or, yeah, or, or that's he does. Cool. Yeah, yeah. would have worked better. But uh, and and it's funny because Rust is like, okay, so do we have a plan here? And they're like, well, not really. I mean, <laughs> we got the uniforms. Do we have we a, got guns. how we getting out of there? Yeah, yeah. it's just a compl- they're just really dumb. So yeah. it's like, oh great. Yeah. Anyway, so Marty's not sure what's going on. Uh, then they grab Tiger and they go. And again, we're going into another. We're going into this urban setting, very different than anything we've seen on the show before. And then, of course, comes the very exciting shootout scene yeah. where they go into the inner city, holding a gun to Tiger's head, pretending to be cops. They burst into the place. At first, it looks like it might work, right? <laughs> Amazingly, <laughs> but then one of the bikers just randomly shoots one of the hostages. Didn't you love the- how the the sound goes out? Like, you mm. hear this ringing and the volume drops. Right. Like it would yeah. if your ears were ringing. And, and to show that Rust isn't a complete nihilist, one of the things he does is he sees that there's a kid playing video games in the house. Uh-huh. And he knows something bad is going to happen, so he takes the time to put the kid in the bathtub. Right. So he's like, stay here. Then he yeah. pointed the gun right at the kid's face. Did you see that? Oh, well. He says, no, don't move. Don't move, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, I was emphasizing his point. Well, he's, he's, he's going through run. his uh, call of duty his way yeah. through it, so the gun is always <laughs> right in front of you. There we go. And then it, it's funny. It's totally believable somehow that Matthew McConaughey could be in the middle of this gunfight, get out of the house without getting hit, Dragging the only two this white guys ginger in the along, yeah. right? The only two white guys in the neighborhood dragging ginger along, break into another house, get on the phone, call Marty, tell him to meet him in another place. Still dragging helicopter, ginger. helicopters, and police everywhere, <laughs> gunfire all around them. Yeah. Still dragging this dumb guy's ass, and they and they get in the car. 
at the end. But yes. then Ginger starts to get away, but no big deal. He just grabs him <laughs> right, back. Right, right. Yeah, I mean... But well, it there's works. nowhere for Ginger to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah he's, that's he's probably point. safer with Marty than he is with, he or is, with Russ. Yeah. Ginger's, so, <laughs> Ginger's in trouble. So. Whether you want to believe these things or not, there's a couple of legendary elements to this. First of all, it is all one big take. They, yep. they yeah, shot, right. with, they shot yep. with cuts. They did multiple takes, but it, it the, the, there's no point where they broke and then did a reset up. Right. It's one run through multiple times. And that's pretty rare in television. And the thing mm-hmm. is, uh, according to uh, Pizzolatto, or the director, I forget which, the um, it really is a public housing development. They use a real, mm. real projects, yeah. and they could not take down that fence. It ah. was ir- against uh, government to regulation to take down the fence. They had to climb over it, so they mm. built a whole jib rig for the cameraman so he could step up and get jibbed wow. over the fence. Oh, wow. Ooh. And they, had, they did not have that planned until they got that notice. It's like, because they, they wanted to, they were going to just knock down the fence and uh-huh, run through right. it. And he says, no, you got to leave the fence up. So they had to build a platform jib for a steady camera. <laughs> oh, wow. so cool. Yeah, it's super sexy. Yeah. Enormous so. amount of Now, they war. could be bullshitting us with that because this could be a war story, but it's, it's a good war story. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the episode ends with... Uh, Rust get, uh, getting Ginger into the car and uh, demanding that he give up Lido. And there's a nice helicopter shot of this just completely chaotic neighborhood as yeah. he, mm-hmm. you know, behind them. And, and Rust pistol whips Ginger. And pistol yeah, Ginger. Yeah, well, Ginger suddenly becomes Rust's bitch, yeah. you know, for the rest of the show. So, <laughs> so when this episode aired, uh, Jay Greenspan, who's on our board, he's a, a friend of mine uh, who's a media developer and this kind of stuff. He's very into the show. He liked it. And he uh, ha- and I think Shane as well. We should oh we should shout out to Shane Bowman who's not feeling well. Mm, um, poor Shane. Poor Shane. He was going to be with us tonight, but he's not feeling well. So should we tell what happened? Shane? No, I think we shouldn't be private about what <laughs> yeah. happens okay. to people. <laughs> it's nothing serious, but he's not feeling well. Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, he, uh, Jay and, and, I, and I think it was kind of Shane as well were kind of like, well, I didn't really. I thought that this show has been so sort of slow and languorous up to now, and suddenly we have this action scene that seemed mm-hmm. to come out of nowhere, and it kind of broke the rhythm for me. And I could, I, I was sympathetic to that until we find out what happens with the Reggie Ledoux thing. They've been building to that action scene, mm-hmm. and they weren't mm-hmm. going to give it to us. So you got to get an action scene. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to be ripped off. Yeah. Right. So, because yeah. I was thinking, like, now next week we're going to have a big shootout, and then the week after that it's going to be a helicopter chase or whatever, right? right. And it's like, no, no, you're we're, I'm, I'm depriving you of an action scene that I'm promising, so I'm going to give you one that I didn't promise. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anyway, and like I said, it's uncharacteristic of the rest of the show, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. It was jarring. Yeah. You know, it's very jarring. First time I saw it, I'm like, whoa, they're going where? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, it was very good. I thought. So yeah, amazingly coordinated. Anything else from anybody else? Uh, yeah, I think, first, I think first we're good. Yeah, till, uh, show was very good. good. Very good. So this is the uh, end of part one, and please uh, join us uh, in a couple of days for part two, where we will be covering episodes four through eight. Um, and until then, uh, you know, just start asking the right fucking questions. <laughs>